The Oracle Network. Welcome to Brew Crime. I'm Mike, and my guest today is... Hey, everybody. It's JT. I'm here, formerly known as True Crime Lab. I'm back for uh, our specific episode. Woohoo! So this is going to be Virginia Crimes, because that's where JT's from. <laughs> so we'll see some of the crazy shit that happens in his state. <laughs> there's, there's definitely enough now, let alone looking back. So <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So I think this episode I'm going to go first, but we'll start out with the beer pairing. Yeah. So I went with Home Sweet Home because this is JT's Home Sweet Home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this is a collaboration beer, actually, which is kind of funny because it's a collaboration episode between hey. Yellow Dog Brewing and Daggerad Brewing. And it is a pineapple passion fruit barrel aged fruit smoothie sour, which is a very long name. It's a mouthful. 5.7% alcohol, and it is, it pours like Sunny D or something, like it is super murky. It is. <laughs> the head disappeared right away. It's going to go down so well. Yeah. I should have froze it partially. Ooh. Well, you know, fruit smoothie. Mm. Yeah, it's tons of pineapple, some passion fruit. It's definitely very, very, very fruity. It's a little... Hint that it's going to be tart in the nose. But yeah, it just smells like fruit juice. It tastes like I put fruit juice in a um, soda stream, basically. <laughs> it's carbonated fruit, fruit ju juice with alcohol. Fruit juice hops and soda stream. Yeah, You know, that sounds awesome. like a great combination. <laughs> that sounds like a bitch to clean out that uh, soda stream. but <laughs> Wow, this is really I, good. I wouldn't want to see what happens when the soda stream goes wrong with that one. No. Yeah. Boom. Supposed to put in like water and then add flavor to it later i know but yeah i mean you showed it to me when you just poured it and in the you know the 45 seconds that it took for you to like show it again to me on the screen the the head was gone yeah oh yeah definitely like, <laughs> almost gone. instantly gone yeah but it's got it's got some like uh sparkliness when you sip it like it's very carbonated still even though the head disappeared really fast yeah that's quite good I like I like uh I'm I'm a fan of sours. I like something that makes my mouth go, What the hell did you just make me yeah. drink? <laughs> makes your mouth water a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um those are some of my favorites. But I also like beers that are, you know, meals. So yeah. yeah. You know. I wanna think, did I need I mean I always need a steak, but did I need that steak with this beer? Mm. <laughs> yes. Yes. The answer is always yes. <laughs> you <laughs> <laughs> agreed. All right, well I better get into the story then. Let's do it. So I'm going to be covering the Golden Years Killer. Now, it sounds like there was more than one Golden Years Killer that was happening at this time, but mm -hmm. this one seems to be uh, dubbed the Golden Years Killer. Okay. So I don't personally know a lot about the state of Virginia or Richmond <laughs> in general, and this was a new <laughs> case to me, so... <laughs> Well, I will confirm or deny slash tell you how far they are from me. <laughs> okay, perfect, perfect. So from 1990 to 1996, a string of horrible deaths would happen to older women in the Richmond, Virginia area, totaling 14 mm -hmm. women. Wow. There didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to what was going on, and little to no lead seemed to be present. Good grief. Yeah. 1996 would finally see an end to the murders, but not until a horrible string was undertaken. January 1st, 1996 would start off with a horrible bang as a 75-year-old Lucille Boyd would be beaten and strangled in her home. Good grief. Yeah. Her body had been placed face down in the bathtub. Her back door had been kicked in while the intruder entered the home. Lucille had lived in that home for more than 30 years, all of that alone. She had worked as a clerk for the Federal Mogul Corp, and after that, mm -hmm. she had worked as a secretary for Air Conditioning Supply, Inc. 
I don't know if you've ever heard of either of those, but uh, nope, <laughs> <laughs> nope. But it's I mean it's my backyard. You know, yeah. I mean if that's maybe that's giving too much away about my location, but I mean literally right there. Yeah. So it also sounds a lot like, and I don't know. We'll probably we're, we'll get into a pattern of some sort. Yeah. You did say random, but it sounds a lot like uh, Timothy Spencer, who was the South Side Strangler. That happened in Richmond as well, I mean, he killed five people fairly the same way there was there was a podcast a southern nightmare that actually covered it really really well it's very it's very similar other than the ages yeah but i'm interested to hear about the rest of this so i hope that um at 75 years old she was retired but i'm not even sure it kind of sounded like she could have still been working <laughs> welcome to america we're, we work till we're dead <laughs> i know right I'm sure it's not unique to our country. No, um, it's it's happening everywhere. I mean, it's definitely yeah. like that here. Yeah. So next up, maybe Verlander would be murdered on March 28th at the age of 84. Mm. Her body was sadly found by her nieces and nephews as they had just arrived at her home as it was her birthday. And they were going to celebrate the day. Good grief. Yeah. Well, she never did have any children of her own, she treated her nieces and nephews like her own, and they would say that she was an extraordinary woman. At one time, she had worked at the Library of Virginia and uh, was even able to help author Douglas S. Freeman find information for the books he was working on at the time. I'm not sure who he is, but he seemed to be uh, important. (laughs) Doug Freeman. Uh, The name sounds so familiar. As I sit here vigorously typing, yeah. big. he was a historian, biographer, newspaper editor. Oh, there you go. Oh, he did. He did multi-volume biographies of Robert E. Lee and George Washington. Ooh, so that's probably what she assisted him with. Welcome, welcome to the South. Yeah. We do biographies <laughs> on Robert <laughs> Lee. <laughs> uh, yep. There was talk of a Cadillac being found outside of Mamie's home on the day that she was killed. That was reported stolen from a home in which another victim was living. Wow. I find it a bit odd, though, that it seems Jan Foster, 55, who lived at the home where the car was stolen, was not found until April 22nd or 23rd, almost a month later. So it seems weird. So, first off, she's a lot younger than the other two that we've talked about. Yeah. Right? We had like 73, 84, and now 55. So, I don't know. I mean, looking back, you know, couch quarter quarterbacking or whatever it's kind of easy to to link it up i don't know how easy it was to figure out was that car stolen where it was stolen yeah. and are we going to follow up it, it, i don't know when they got that info do you know my next line was maybe the car was stolen before her murder but <laughs> yeah. i'm not sure because it just there was no information it was really vague yeah. and weird that it would be missing yeah. that long yeah i mean and maybe she t- <sighs> there are so many things that could go into not reporting a stolen yeah. car i mean or, you know, it was just one of many at the time that were reported and good luck finding yeah, it. You know, a exactly. lot of times stolen cars are stolen cars. If it wasn't notated that, um, who was the woman again that the car was stolen from? That was Jan Foster. Jan Foster. So if she wasn't found to be dead and have had been dead for quite some time, I'd say that she probably just didn't report it. Yeah, it could be. Or it just got lost. Yeah. She had unfortunately been killed in a similar manner, being strangled to death in her bedroom. God. Jen held down a job at a local mall cleaning up tables at the food court. She was development disabled and known as a slow learner and sadly had never made it past second grade and never learned to read or write. So that could even okay. like go into that not reporting. Yeah, very well could have. I mean, just a one piece of bad advice or something. Yeah. yeah. It was a security guard that called authorities when it was noticed she did not show up for a shift at the mall. On the same day, Elizabeth Siebert, 69, was also found murdered in her bathtub. Elizabeth was living alone as her partner had passed away. She lived at the third floor in an apartment building. Elizabeth was expected to go on a trip with her church group the day after her murder, and when they did not see her at the church waiting to go, they went to check on her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then when they found that her door was locked and no one was answering the door they found someone with a key and got access to the apartment sure unfortunately for the church group members they found her body yeah that's not (laughs) that is not preferable Mm -mm. i think any group would probably go investigate yeah you know and it's more how often do we hear that somebody doesn't show up for a commitment and then somebody goes to check on them right i mean you know we talk about such terrible things but 
they cared, yeah. right? And to go look. And if they wouldn't have, who knows how long it would have been. No, for sure. These murders didn't seem to bring in any clues as to who could have murdered these women. And the other 10 between 1990 and 1995, sadly. Question, because yes. I don't I don't like have pictures of the victims up. Obviously, they were a little bit older. Were there? You mentioned that there weren't really any patterns. Was there any patterns to what they looked like? I mean, other than their age? I'll get into a little bit about how there okay. could be some uh, connections to them. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. I'm jumping ahead now. Yeah. <laughs> The killer would go dormant for a time until June of that year. Okay. The women had some connections, though, as Mamie and Jane both belonged to a senior social group at the Monument Heights Baptist Church. Okay. St. Mary's Hospital also found Elizabeth as a volunteer while Jane had applied for a job there only recently. It's a couple little connections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, Mamie and Lucille had both spent time at St. Mary's Hospital as patients in their last years of their life. But again, this led to no real solid leads, but they, they've all kind of got loose connections. There's something. There. It's so weird to hear you say some of these things, because I literally drive by them almost every day. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, so when you say in my backyard, I mean, yeah. I could look out. The, no, I couldn't look out the window. But almost, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. June would see his MO change as he killed three men. Yeah, Montanique Winston, 35, found likely two weeks after his death on June 22nd. Gary Wayne Shelton, 46, found on June 14th, and John Wade Pleasance, 42, found on June 29th. Two of these men were beaten to death, and the third was found strangled. Huh. Some articles make it sound like these men were homeless, but I'm not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. One other man linked to these murders was a man beaten to inches of his life in June. He would be found with 36 skull fractures and would not wake from his coma for a whole three weeks. Holy crap. Yeah, like literally to an inch of his life. So he's moved from older women to middle-aged men. It's so... <sighs> yeah. It's like, you know, we, we sometimes we hear people starting kind of older and then moving younger. Yeah. But you don't usually see that gender. Not usually, no. That sex shift. So, <sighs> yeah, no wonder they were confused. Yeah. Oh yeah, you know, and I mean, this was this was early. It wasn't early criminology, but it was. It wasn't what it is now. Yeah, it's early enough. So, yeah. On July first of nineteen ninety six, a homeless man would be arrested on the murder of the three men. He was picked up on charges of trespassing, but would go on to confess to the murders of the men. The Richmond, Virginia cold case squad would now focus their energy on this man. His name was. Leslie Leon Burchardt, and he was a homeless man that lived in the area and struggled with schizophrenia. Okay. He was six foot and thin with a scraggly beard. Right after his arrest, the Golden Ears murders also stopped, which would be quite the coincidence. Yeah, that's <laughs> that kind of, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. While there was no evidence that he murdered the four women mentioned in this story, he did have information that only the killer would know, as it was holdback evidence. So there's there's two things to this. Yeah. You know, one, for sure, was him. Yeah. Two, with, you know, his, the lifestyle, what he led, you know, being for, you know, homeless or whatever, he could have heard it from somebody else. And it could have just been a coincidence, yeah. the fact that they stopped. It maybe, maybe the arrest was too close to home for the killer, and he went somewhere else. Um, but yeah, that's, that's uh, a little, you know, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's not a chicken. So, yeah, you know. <laughs> and then he would take credit for the murder of these women once they had the whole back evidence. So, yep, there it yep. is. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is what happens, kids, when you jump ahead of the story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's perfect. <laughs> I looked him up. He is very scraggly. Yes, yes, he is. Um, he's very scraggly. And I mean, that's that's obviously kind of a result of lifestyle, yeah. you know. But um, yeah, yeah, you, you know, you, you wouldn't miss him. No, you wouldn't. You know, not at all. In the cases of the three men he murdered and the one he maimed, he was given a sentence of 105 years in prison. <laughs> welcome to Virginia. Yeah. Well, welcome <laughs> to the United States. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah. During the trial, he was forced to take drugs to manage his schizophrenia, and he was found to be legally responsible for his actions and competent to stand trial. <laughs> so this is a quote here. He's like two different people, Stacey F. Garrett III said in a 1998 interview. 
This was talking about him on and off the drugs. He hated to take the drugs, though, as it got rid of the voices in his head, and he liked them too much to lose them. Okay, so first off, (laughs) that tells me that he's not competent. (laughs) And it's also not the first time, nor the last time, nor has it stopped where either the United States or Virginia has imprisoned somebody long enough for them to take meds to then test them to be competent. Yeah. To then try them. Yeah. Right. And I'm not saying what he did wasn't, you know, what can be excused yeah. by by anything, really. You know, there's a lot of folks out there that do suffer from schizophrenia and they don't go and murder multiple people, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so there's no excuse for that. But you don't <laughs> you don't wait until somebody's, quote, balanced yeah. who really still isn't balanced and then try them that's not how that yeah. not how that works it's like me liking like i've always liked the browns but it's like me waiting for them to all of a sudden do all right this season and now i like the it doesn't no <laughs> that's a terrible analogy but that's, you know, yeah it's, it's all i got um yeah I, don't, I hate it when that happens well we've got it. a we've got a it's a prison hospital basically here that is for, I forget what the proper term is now. It used to be the criminally insane. We lost our hospital, Riverview, that was to help people with mental health issues. But we still mm-hmm. have that one at least. So they're not going into general population in most prisons. It's it's a specialized prison for these people that have major, major mental health issues and are very dangerous criminally. Oh, re- wow. Yeah. I know that like the UK has specific communities that they've set up for folks to help them out, but they actually kind of, as far as I understand, I mean, I've seen a couple, (laughs) I'm I'm, I'm the recliner guy who understands a documentary, right? But from what I saw in a documentary and people can correct me if I'm I'm wrong and they will. Um, (laughs) But, um, you know, they, they, they also have folks that follow those cases and visit and see how they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. We don't, we don't have that here. I mean, good luck if you can get insurance to you know pay for prescriptions. Yeah, no doubt. You know, if 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 you're already suffering from something, you have a pre existing condition. There's a lot of issues there that need resolved. I mean, so so that hospital that you're talking yeah. about is that that's that's 100 percent for those who are dangerous to the community themselves, criminals. Yes. Yes. Okay. Do you guys have like? We're getting off topic, sorry, but do you guys have, like, mental health care that, I mean, how's the program there? Yeah, it's not great. I mean, okay. it's, unfortunately, mental health is not something that's covered by our medical, really, here. So, Sounds familiar. Yeah, that's the one thing that really doesn't have the great socialized medicine in Canada, <laughs> unfortunately. Which is, like, some of the groundwork for some of the most gruesome crimes that i've ever committed you know and i'm not saying that with a stronger mental health system those things wouldn't have happened but we certainly could (laughs) with a stronger system and more money to understanding the mind and the psyche and that stuff i feel like we could stem a lot of stuff that goes on at least help people out yeah for sure here we go i actually just found it here The, the name is colony farm and there's actually a park around it which is kind of interesting and they call it a forensic psychiatric hospital. That is a really nifty way to say we keep people here that you don't want out there. Yes. <laughs> 190 um, bed secure facility. Just uh, is it does it say anything about population? Is it overpopulated? Uh, there might be 190 beds, but like if it's anything like the American prison system, <laughs> it's way overpopulated. I don't know. It's yes, 190 bed security uh, secure facility in Coquitlam, BC that treats people who have been found not criminally responsible for a crime or unfit to stand trial due to mental disorder. Okay, but okay. You, you don't go there if uh, it's can, something minor. Can you believe? Like, I don't know what their process is in Canada, but but like somebody like um, this fella who's given medicine found sane quote by the legal definition and culpable for for his crimes and then he's put into general pop of a regular prison yeah it's that's awful that happens all the time all yeah. the time they, they and, need special um, treatment they need to be put somewhere that they can get good treatment instead of uh just being thrown to the wolves right and you know a lot of people will argue they're criminals they don't need treatment but but here's the thing <laughs> they're, they're still human people beings they might have messed up pretty bad yeah but, they might be you know, horrible people, but they're still people. Right. 
but we don't throw them in to be to like cleanse the population by you know and then and then you're just adding more crimes to the other guys who are in yeah, prison exactly but you know we have a tendency of throwing criminals away quote criminals humans away yeah you know um oh, exactly. all right that's a that's a whole nother conversation for another yeah. day <laughs> all right <laughs> He was also sentenced to four life sentences, which I think were um, one count for each murdered woman. But it is a bit thin on the details for these cases, so it it, it could just be for the men. I'm not sure, but well, interesting. It doesn't really matter at this point because he's never leaving prison, right? He, yeah, no. Mm-mm. He would also take credit for one more murder of a man that was never found by the police, so we don't know. Okay. So later he would claim that he only confessed to the Golden Year murders because, quote, I thought I could be a celebrity killer. Huh. If I couldn't be the best man in the world, I'd just try to be the worst man who ever lived. All right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, he admitted to these things. He knew, quote, what nobody else would know, yeah. you know, which there's a lot of there's a fine line there. Yeah. But 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 the evidence must have been so thin on linking him to the golden years. Well, I guess if really. he had all this stuff that no one else knew. Yeah. I suppose so. I mean, oh. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so when asked to summarize his life, Bouchard said, there was so much negativity in my life. When I had a choice, I chose the negative one. Leslie Leon Bouchard did not have a happy life and was quoted as saying that his life had been so miserable and so devoid of accomplishment, he never would have crawled out of the womb if he had the chance to do it over again. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) He grew up in South Richmond and would work in menial jobs up until he was 29. It was then that he would seek treatment for his mental illness. He would drift his way to the Central State Hospital and then to Richmond Group Home for the Mentally Ill. Okay. Unfortunately, he would end up on the streets after a time. It was believed by many that his six-month murder spree in 1996 might just line up with when he went off his medication. Yep. This is a quote from Leslie again. They kept me company when there was no TV or radio around, he said. They talked about heaven being a really glorious place. You can do anything you want to do in heaven. You can even do scuba diving. There's water in heaven. So, that's yeah. These are his voices. The, yeah, I mean, we all have that inner monologue, but mine doesn't tell me to go scuba diving in heaven. No, <laughs> not at all. Sorry, man, can't relate. Yeah. In what seems to be 2002, Leslie Leon Bouchard was taken to Lonesome Pine Hospital on July 30th as he was suffering from an unspecified illness. He would die only days later on August 1st, but I was unable to find a cause for his death, so who knows if it was natural causes or whatever. Yeah, I mean, he didn't really, I mean, other, (laughs) he could have brought it on himself in prison and they didn't want to say anything about it. He could have swallowed a bunch of pills. He could have cheeked the pills and then swallowed a bunch later and they didn't want to add that to the statistic. Yeah. Um, There's been a lot of weird stuff that's happened in this state's prison system, so. That's not good. No, no, it's not great, but uh, I mean, that kind of goes for a lot of different places. Yeah, so. for sure. Yeah. So it's just sad that if this man had been helped more with his mental health issues and maybe given more of a chance in life, these seven people likely would have lived many more years. The world needs to stop treating homelessness, addiction, and mental health the way we do as it causes far more issues than just tackling the heart of the problem. Oh, God, absolutely. I mean, Southern California and like San Francisco, the homeless population is insane. Yep. I mean, down the road in tents, right? It's a tent city and, and folks that move in there that want to like upgrade the city want to just push them out. Yep. But here's the thing is that number one, they were there first. But number two, there's a reason why they were like that. So can we actually talk about the crux of the situation and try to fix it? Yep. You know, rather than just kind of being like shoe. Yeah. Um, well, if you that does nothing. If you delete California and you say Vancouver, it's the same exact problem. Um, oh, really? When they closed Riverview Hospital here years ago, most of the people there ended up on the downtown east side of Vancouver. There's homeless camps in Strathcona Park, which is in the neighborhood next to downtown east side. It's huge. There's all kinds of crime and violence because of fentanyl and drugs. The city's not spending money to deal with it. The the police just 
use violence and nothing else. That's the thing. If they would have just done the work ahead of time and been like, okay, we need a place for these folks, yep. they wouldn't be spending so much trying to now react. Well, another problem, to too, happened. is that, you know, decades ago, a lot of provinces in Canada to deal with their homelessness issues, they gave their homeless one way bus tickets to Vancouver because our winters aren't as cold. What? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of. That's interesting. Yeah, it's horrible. And yeah, they may not freeze to death as fast here because it doesn't get so cold, but, you know, wet and close to freezing is still just as deadly. And now they're in a place where they don't know anybody. Yep. They don't have any connections and they don't even have a chance. Yeah. What, um, what shut down that hospital? Do you know? Uh, budget. <laughs> Jesus. Yep. All right. Mm, money. Yeah, let's see here. When did it close? It, there is, I think they've reopened one little wing of it, but it's most of it's closed. Sure. And not, I'm not saying that it was a great place because it had lots of issues. Sure. But I mean, you know, a place with issues you can patch and try and fix versus just shutting down. It's just not, again, not solving the problem. Um, just pushing it around. And I, I hate to say, quote, problem. I'm not, I don't mean the people are the problem. No, but yeah. The concept of homelessness, the concept of mental health. That is an issue we need to tackle. Yes. Across the, you know, around the world. So yeah, here we go. It closed permanently on July 2012. And it had over 800 beds. Good grief. Yeah, it was a big place. And, it, you know, it turned into a film studio for like X-Files and all kinds of stuff over the years. <laughs> Oh my god. Yeah, oh yeah, it's still a lot of the buildings are still there and they're supposed to be haunted as fuck. <laughs> I mean, I believe it. Yeah. I believe it. But yeah, that that's my case. Dude, that's that's wild. Number one, it's wild that it happened in my backyard. Yeah. But uh, you know, it's it's also wild that it was very close to the the South Side Strangler. Did it did any did any sites, any sources that you found mention what he strangled them with? No, they didn't. And yeah. I also okay. did notice, though, once they had finished writing that, I mm-hmm. found there was actually a woman that was uh, found to be responsible for a couple of the other murders that were the Golden Years murders. But I, I didn't follow with that because that wasn't the case I was doing. But there's more to this story, even. Wow. Women are known to poison, right? But... You know, strangulation and well, elsewise. I don't. I don't know. I don't know how they were killed. I. I, oh, I okay. didn't go down gotcha. that rabbit hole, but more of these. Yeah. Like, because how many women did I say were killed over all here? Psh. See, blah, blah, that's blah, blah, why blah. you have a life and I don't. I just keep going down the rabbit yeah. hole. Here we go. <laughs> there was fourteen women total, and he only killed five. Right. So yeah. there, there was a bunch of other women too. They were all the Golden Years murders, but he was the Golden Years killer. It's like the detectives of Richmond were like, well, we got our man yeah. for every one of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you didn't. I'm sorry. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. What a story. Mm-hmm. What, well, what a case. It's not a story. Yeah, it's a what case. a case. Yeah. Let me get that right. This episode of Brew Crime is brought to you by Podcorn.com. Hey, fellow podcasters. Have you ever wanted to start monetizing your podcast? The cost of a website, audio hosting, equipment, and swag can all add up really fast if you're not careful after all. This process can feel like a daunting task, as I know, but Podcorn makes this really easy. Now, indie podcasters no longer have to try and reach out to corporations and try to sell them on putting ads on your show. Podcorn takes that step as they find the brands that want to work with podcasters and collect them on their website's marketplace. From the dashboard, you can reach out to those brands and pitch them on what your show can do for their brand. You can pitch all kinds of promotional spots such as pre-roll and mid-roll host-read ads, interview segments, topical discussions, and more. Not only do they find the prospective ad partners, but you get to set your rates. Podcorn also protects and supports your show to ensure that you get compensated for the work you do for these brands. We've been lucky enough to work with the awesome brands Best Fiends, Ballsy, and Hi-Fi Candle Studios on top of working directly with Podcorn.com. So if you're looking to take your podcast to the next level, make sure to head to Podcorn.com now and sign up. You will not be disappointed with your choices. Explore sponsorship opportunities and start monetizing your podcast by signing up here at podcorn.com slash podcasters. Well, are you ready for mine? Absolutely. It's uh, it's a little wild. We we go a little bit all over the place, but that's okay. I wish I had a clever title, really. Um, it's kind of like the RPG vampire slayer murder. I don't know. I'm burying the lead. Buffy the vampire slayer. Into. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So typically what... You know, I was talking to you before, but what I used to do is I'd I'd cover kind of the location and a little bit more about that area just so you get a good idea of 
how this person grew up. So Clara Jane Schwartz is our is our um, <laughs> is our criminal quote who who we're talking about today. This this crime happened on December eighth, two thousand one. It was a murder parricide. Uh, her father, Robert Schwartz, um, was the one who was killed. He was stabbed with a two foot long sword. Oh, geez. yeah. And this happened in Leesburg, Virginia. A little bit about Leesburg for, for those who don't live around here. Uh, like, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, I've never even yeah. heard of it. So it exists. It is does it? 33 miles west, northwest of D.C. So it's okay. in Virginia and Loudoun County, but it's 30. I know where yeah. that is. There, there, were, there were some people that stormed it recently. <laughs> well, <laughs> come on in. Um, <laughs> so it was it was founded around the French and Indian War in October of 1758. And in 2019, the population was around 53,700. Okay. Pretty yeah, small. pretty small. I mean, I would imagine that's gone up substantially in two years just because the area around DC is so overdeveloped. It's disgusting. Um, the traffic is terrible. So yeah. to give you a little idea about just like the history of Leesburg, which will be of no surprise to anybody, the Piedmont region was once occupied by multiple tribes that were driven yep. Northwest. They occupied the area for 400 years and uh, yep. That's yep. It. That's about right. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, 1699, the Algonquin Picataway, I hope I'm saying that right, moved to an island in the Potomac around the area of Leesburg, and they were there when Europeans visited what is now Loudoun County. So as Tidewater planters moved into the area from the south and the east, obviously European settlement showed up in the late 1730s. Um, I say I say obviously, okay. like everybody knows the history. So Leesburg happened kind of sometime in, before 1755. The village located there prospered for what they were doing. The British Colonial Council basically ordered the establishment of the county courthouse. Therefore, you know, you get a court. It's like nowadays you get a dollar general and it's it's a real town. Then you got a courthouse. Boom, you're good to go. So that year in October, the Virginia General Assembly founded the town of Leesburg on 60 acres. Now Leesburg's almost 8,000 acres. And it was renamed to honor Thomas Lee, who lived in Loudoun County. A lot of people think like General Lee or whatever, but this was actually Thomas Lee. Okay, that's better. Yeah, yeah, right. So when the British (laughs) army came in and invaded and stormed the (laughs) capital, harsh. Yeah. So (laughs) Leesburg actually served as a temporary haven for U.S. government and its archives. So that when they, yeah, when they flee D.C., they went to Leesburg with all their stuff while the British army stormed the capital. don't think it happened you know january 6th but you know (laughs) yeah Yeah. so um leesburg serves as the center of government for loudon county there's about fifty three thousand seven hundred twenty seven. most of them white 71 percent white actually nine and a half percent african-american 0.4 percent native american when they had that land to begin with (laughs) wow colonialism right and it just kind of goes down from there the median income is actually around sixty eight thousand american dollars here's 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 what kills me about the united states is the income difference between men and women and then in, in leesburg the the median income for males was seventy eight thousand dollars and for women it was thirty five thousand dollars oh jesus christ i mean it's not great anywhere but that is exceptionally it is bad, horrible I and i you know there's a yeah. lot of factors that go into it sure but i i don't understand so- <laughs> no that's that's not so Something to understand about Clara Jane Schwartz. She went to JMU, which is in Harrisburg, Virginia, which is probably about two and a half to three hours from me, I think, west. But she was very much into role playing games. And this one that she really enjoyed was called Underworld. And I attempted to find a little bit about Underworld. There are some basic things. There are some very 90s websites. (laughs) But I did find a description of Underworld, if you will allow me to. Oh, absolutely. Yes, I want to hear about this. Down below the streets of New York City, there exists a world of wonder and adventure unseen by those above. Magic courses like blood through veins made from steel tracks and transformers. The Underworld is home to the homeless, to the freaks, to the junk men and more, steely-eyed bravos hunt their prey in dark tunnels far below the subways, while brave taggers scout new paths between the varied domains and mark trails for all to follow. 
Creatures of legend walk the platforms below the city, and brilliant artificers build inventions of bizarre science born of madness. This is a world of heroes and villains, of magic and romance, of gods and monsters, unseen, unknown, unforgettable. I really hope... (laughs) They said Transformers. (laughs) I am Optimus Prime. (laughs) Yeah. Star please, Scream! Please, uh, <laughs> please add some epic music behind that. Um, <laughs> do, 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 do. Yeah, that's that's the epic music. <laughs> that's like just, that's like Sir Robin's song from Monty Python. Yeah. <laughs> um, Brave Sir yeah, Robin. So it's, <laughs> um, so it's an adventure game, and it's either tabletop live action play. So there is some live action role playing. So LARPing sometimes involved. Yeah. So exactly, and really all you need are the guidelines in the book. Yeah. It's uh, it's 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 easy to understand. I mean, if you're even remotely familiar with like role playing, you actually heard the different types of like characters you can play in the actual description. It's quite interesting, and it's kind of it's rated mid to high. I mean, I was actually reading reviews. I told you I go down rabbit holes, yeah. <laughs> which were quite fascinating. So Clara Jane Schwartz was really into this. She was really into Renaissance fairs, all that kind of stuff, and renaissance in a second hero play part so the murder of robert schwartz occurred december 8th 2001 it was orchestrated by 20 year old daughter clara jane schwartz as part of a fantasy role-playing game robert schwartz was actually he was prominent in the scientific community he had ties to the occult and role-playing it was bound to get picked up this this whole case you know i mean you you mentioned role-playing and everybody's hopping on it like oh satan you know um which they might not have been wrong this time around (laughs) So he was, in terms of, I said he was prolific in the scientific community. He was nationally renowned uh, in the field of biometrics and DNA research. Yeah, and in 1978, he was a co-author with someone, Margaret Dayhoff, uh, of a key paper in science that actually provided the first experimental evidence of the theory of symbiogenetic origin of cellular mitochondria and chloroplasts. I read this, and it went over my head five times. And then I, um, I understood a little bit more of it. But he also was, uh, in 92, he was a founding member of the Virginia Biotechnology Association. So he was very well known. And in fact, his murder happened around a couple other scientists' murders. And for a second there, they thought they might be linked. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you get into those conspiracies, right? This one was not linked. <laughs> On December 8th, 2001, Schwartz was stabbed to death with a sword at his farmhouse in Leesburg. His body wasn't discovered until two days later. Three days after the murder, a then 19-year-old Catherine Inglis made a statement to police which implicated Schwartz's daughter Clara in his murder. Inglis said that Clara discussed the planning and murder with her, a 21-year-old Michael Fole, and 18-year-old, 18-year-old Kyle Holbert. The motive for the murder was that Clara insisted that her father had hit her and she thought he was trying to poison her. Now, wow, that seems like a bit of a leap. It does seem like a bit of a leap. I don't know whether that was just pure justification for we need to do this or if she actually thought something was going on and maybe something, you know, something bigger was happening. But in terms of Clara Schwartz, she was a sophomore at James Madison University, like I mentioned at the time of the murder. I said she's obsessed by vampires, assassins, magic, all that stuff, which in and of itself is totally fine. It's when you use it to yeah. justify running your father through with the sword. Um, that's when it becomes a problem. Yep. So according to part of the appeal, I actually was able to find the, the entire appeal online for, for her wow. case. Nice. Which is really hard to find these days anything. I feel like they've really locked stuff down since True Crime's taken off. <laughs> yeah. They're like, we don't want them to know. But Clara told Inglis, so um, the, the quote friend, that her father was, quote, continually doing stuff to her, like trying to poison her. Uh, during the summer and fall of 2001, Clara told Inglis that her father was, quote, poisoning meat she would eat, hitting her on occasion, and pulling her under the water in their pool. <laughs> So she also told English that she wished he was dead and that, quote, she would inherit a third of a million dollars from her father when he died. So we're kind of <laughs> here's some justification, but then I get money. It's, it's... Yeah. That, that... <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, unfortunately, that's just what you hear all the time, right? It's always about the friggin' Oh, yeah, money. and you know as soon as Inglis told the police, you know, while she was being interviewed, they were just like, mm-hmm, ooh, she wanted money. It's like, that's yeah. enough. Ooh. Yeah, let's go pick her up. Yeah. But Inglis never saw any bruises or any other evidence of physical abuse by Clara's father during the time she knew Clara. So in August of 2001, Clara began dating somebody, a boy named Patrick House. Uh, I say boy, young adult. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's a boy now to me. Uh, <laughs> Clara complained to House that her father had attempted to molest and kill her. So she's continuing to spread Ooh. this stuff, right? And, and yeah. Clara made statements to House about basically her desire for her father's death and requested that he kill her. You know, if you love me, you'll kill him for me. Slay the dragon and get the gold. Yes. I don't know why I made Clara. You need to LARP I made, this. <laughs> I made Clara sound like an 80-year-old wizard. Um, (laughs) which just sounded right. (laughs) Patrick House. So she gave House a book that contained information about poisoning and told him that she wanted her father's killing to, quote, look natural. So it would not be able to be traced back to her. And she also told House that she would inherit money (laughs) from her father when he died. But, you know, she was she was concerned and he was trying to cut her out of his will. The butterfly (laughs) swoon. All I'm saying is that if she spread this stuff, I'd cut her out of my will, too. But uh, I think all of this is just not with the sword. This is all just a story she's concocting. This is all. Yeah, I think she's really taken to role playing. Let's be honest. Um, Yeah, it sounds like so in September of 2001, Clara went out to dinner with House and Inglis. And during the meal, Clara said that her steak had been poisoned and speculated that her father had gotten in touch with the cook. I don't. Okay. so later, Clara asked House when he planned on killing her father and House responded when the time was right, it would happen. And I see that as him saying, I ain't going to do that, but I'll keep telling you what you want to hear. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. What's in it for me? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. So that same month, Clara met somebody named Kyle Holbert at a Renaissance fair in Maryland. I've actually been to this Renaissance fair. If I know the one that they're talking about, it is massive. And I mean, I bet. massive. So she met this guy at a Renaissance fair. I mean, this is like her bread and butter. This is, this is where she was born to be. Yep. And they quickly became close friends. And uh, Halbert also became friends with Inglis and Inglis's boyfriend, Michael Fole. On Thanksgiving weekend, Clara arranged for Halbert to camp clandestinely, <laughs> which is hysterical to me. Yeah. <laughs> in the woods near her father's house. Inglis and Fole dropped Halbert off after dark. And the next day, Halbert went to the house to see Clara. During the brief visit, he met Clara's father and older sister. And during that visit, he actually showed them a sword he had with him. So he showed them the sword and then he went. Soon thereafter, I I, I find this really strange that somebody arrived at my farmhouse with a sword to see my daughter, right? Yeah, it's a little a little worrisome. so strange. I called it a sword. Sword. <laughs> so soon thereafter, Halbert, who actually actually asked Clara to send him money for gas, so Fole could drive him drive them for gloves and a quote do rag to prevent him from leaving hairs at the scene. Oh boy! And then on December <sighs> yeah, on December sixth, Clara wrote Halbert a check for sixty dollars and sent it to him overnight. So Thanksgiving, he shows. Basically, the family, the murder weapon, he leaves, and then December 6th, she pays. Now, on December 8th, Inglis and Full dropped Halbert off near Clara's father's property. Halbert had his sword strapped to his side, probably feeling pretty badass. I mean, I can imagine. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I feel pretty, That's quite the I LARP. feel pretty badass, too. So he proceeded on foot to Clara's father's house. And when Clara's father answered the door, Halbert entered the house and killed him. Basically walked in, pulled the sword, and he stabbed her father th- over 30 times with the sword. Jeez. I mean, I mean, if you're going to have a sword, like, stab? That's not what a sword is for, unless it's one of those, like, fencing right. swords or saber <laughs> swords. Haha, <laughs> I've got you. Yeah, like, if, if it's like a European sword, it's about slashing and hacking. Like. Well, he wasn't a very good LARP, but... I mean, the thing, the thing about stabbing and stuff, and correct me if I'm wrong, I've been out of the game for a little while, but, I mean, it's a very personal thing. Um, yeah. So, I think, I mean, other than the fact that he was pushed by role-playing, 
um, or maybe Clara asked him to do it that way because it was personal to her. I don't understand why he had to stab him 30 times. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely uh, yeah overkill. But the next day, Holbert told Claire on the phone that he had killed her father. Well, you know, Inglis talks to the police. Clara is arrested. She's taken to jail. Clara told her cellmate that the plan was for Holbert to kill her father, quote, because if anything came up, he would take the blame because he had mental issues. Oh, Here geez. we go. Right. I didn't mean for all that to link up nicely, but yeah, we're no doubt. On a bow, why don't we? Halbert actually had a history of mental disorders. He had a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia, hyperactivity disorder, oh, and bipolar disorder. His family had basically found him too difficult to handle. So he'd been in several psychiatric institutions, which obviously did nothing, right? Nothing. Yeah. I feel bad for this I know. Person. And to be honest with you, he probably felt in some way with this role playing or the, I don't know, that he felt like he belonged because he could pretend to be somebody yeah, else, sure. right? Definitely. And Clara played into that like it was, a, you know, an Emmy nominated role. Oh, yeah. Played him like a puppet. Right. And, and so it turned out that he was also deeply involved, like I said, in role playing. And that involved vampires and stuff like that. And, you know, we all know that these games don't cause somebody to become violent, you know. And the majority of folks nope. who are involved in live action role playing stuff, they're in it for fun and creative outlets, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I know. I know some LARPers, and I lot. I know lots of people that play role playing mm-hmm. games, but I am. They're all really nerdy, fun. People. I am one of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm not just like fighting for it because I, you know, I'd tell you the truth if it did. Um, but LARPs also have have a have a habit of attracting mentally unstable folks because it encourages their delusions or what they're they're imagining in their heads it basically encourages yeah. those things it's like i can live this out um this is legit yeah and you can just you can just live your your own live in your own world instead of having to live in the shitty world we all right actually not live only in. that but now i'm justified because everybody else is living in my world too yeah and uh so halbert was was a larper because of that and he had a fascination with medieval wizardry and weaponry and he eventually offered a pretty chilling seven page confession to the police Jeez. February 2nd, 2002, she was charged with the crime. She was formally indicted for murder as well as conspiracy to commit murder and solicitation of murder charges on March 31st. The other three, Inglis, Fowl, and Holbert, were all previously indicted for Robert Schwartz's murder. So her, her three friends were indicted before she was. I think they were just racking some stuff up and probably gathering testimony. Yeah. So... Clara was the first of her co-defendants to go on trial, actually. So she was indicted last, but first to go on trial in October of 2002. So almost a year, about two months short of a year. Clara was portrayed as a manipulative woman who used a role-playing game Underworld to convince her friends to kill her father. That's pretty much what happened. Sounds on point, And they said um, Clara Schwartz wanted her father dead. She had hated her father for a long time. And after failing to enlist the friend to kill her father, Clara became desperate for some reason. And this is why she found Kyle. The defense argued that Kyle Holbert, Robert Schwartz's killer, had taken Clara's directives to kill her father out of context of the role-playing game. Jeez. I don't... There's... (laughs) That's not... No, 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 no. That's not true. (laughs) She wasn't rolling a D20 to figure out if he attacked. You know, like this wasn't. She told him, I need you to kill this guy. Yeah, that's a D666. (laughs) (laughs) I like what you did there. Uh, (laughs) But, you know, they said, quote, Clara never intended for any person to kill her father. Obviously not the case. Yeah, fuck Um, that. Not not true. The prosecution's star witness was Patrick House, who was her basically her ex-boyfriend and that uh, you know this is the one that she initially tried to get to kill her father and he quote testified that clara spoke increasingly about killing her father and that she researched herbal poisons because she wanted his death to appear natural i don't know why she ended up going with a 26 inch sword that's not very natural to me (laughs) it would have been a medieval time yes yes (laughs) but not in 2001 um despite second leading despite how fucked up 2001 was it a year nope (laughs) Not quite 2020. No, though. 2020 far outweighs. <laughs> well, I don't want. I don't want to. It's relative, right? Uh, but 2020 yeah, was relative. pretty, yeah, pretty up though. Uh, <laughs> but House also testified that she spoke of how much money she stood to inherit if he died, and her concerns that he would cut her out of his will. And he stated that she became yeah. increasingly frustrated because he was not carrying out her wish. So she got pissed. 
You know, you're not doing mm-hmm. what I want you to do. So the aftermath of everything, um, October 16th, 2002, the jury convicted. So that means let's see. So that was less, less than probably 10 days. The jury convicted Clara of first degree murder. February 10th, 2003, she was sentenced to serve 48 years in prison. She's in Fluvanna Correctional Center for Women near Troy, Virginia. Um, that's actually two hours south from Leesburg and 24 minutes east of Charlottesville. So okay, heading towards Richmond from Charlottesville. So she's actually made a ton of attempts to appeal her conviction. And the conviction most recently affirmed by the 4th District of the United State Court of Appeals on March 9th, 2010. That's the appeal that I found in terms of the info. Kyle Holbert, who killed her father, was sentenced to life in prison. Michael Fole was sentenced to 20 years. And Catherine Inglis served a one-year sentence for conspiracy to commit murder. Um, I'm sure her testimony, the initial testimony, helped her out. Fole basically carted Holbert back and forth, right, to the house. Um, so that was his bad in terms of like, yeah, yeah. In terms sure. of like the appeal and all that stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and you know, I think, I think you have all my sources, so, you know, those will yeah. go up there. So feel free, everybody go look at that freedom of information. <laughs> um, but this is one of those stories that I used to love to cover because it's just, I don't love to cover it, but it's just one of those ones where it's just like, are you that stupid? Like you can't, you can't, you know, you've got, you've got, high charisma but really low intelligence <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> to speak in <laughs> to speak in role playing you know and uh it, it is it's quite unfortunate because i mean as far as i understood she was quite a bright person and i mean to to be sophomore year at jmu and there wasn't much in terms of what made her think that her father did that and i think the bottom line was she wanted money um yeah i think that's what it came down to and you know that's uh that is the murder of Robert Schwartz stabbed with a two foot long sword. <laughs> Jeez. Or a very long letter letter opener. <laughs> oh yes. You know what? You know what? And I bet you at some point Halbert totally tried to do that. He was just Probably, let me just yeah. let me just let me just get that we get there. <laughs> he popped open cans with it. I mean, what else are you gonna do with a yeah, sword? No I mean, other than put it up on display. I guess shotgun beers i don't know you know uh i guess murder your girlfriend's father yeah yeah it, yeah definitely i mean it didn't even sound like they were estranged you know so welcome to virginia it's for lovers and yeah. sword home sweet home, home sweet home you know cue guns and roses <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> All right. Well, why don't you quickly plug your new podcast that's coming out this summer? Yeah, so I'm really excited. It's a whole nother ball game. I started in the true crime world. That's how I met you, which I'm so glad that I yep. did. Um, tell your friends and tell your enemies about brew crime always. Um, but uh, I also had the the pleasure of meeting Eric from um, True Consequences podcast, and we decided to go a different route. Uh, with this one so we're actually doing a show called emergent tea all tea all shade where we are going back to season one of rupaul's drag race and we are we are recapping every episode with each episode of the podcast so it is a far departure from what we're used to but it's something that we yes. both need desperately and i think this world needs um because good grief 2020 and 2021 were trash enough so let's throw a little shade in there why not yeah, could use some little bit of fabulousness, I think, yes, right? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually never watched RuPaul's Drag Race, but I've seen enough about RuPaul to know pretty cool. Yeah, pretty cool person. Yeah, you know, she's pretty cool. She's had some some stuff pop up now and again. You know, I, everybody does, yeah. let's be honest. Everybody um, does, yeah. But I think initially what always drove me towards watching that show is just the sheer artistry that it takes to create that illusion. And those folks are so damn talented. But don't worry, because Eric and I will definitely find some things to to make jokes about. Yeah. We will always find things to make jokes about. So oh, it's going to be course, a fun time. Um, we'll also be talking about current events and throwing shade that way. And so it's good. Maybe may, maybe we'll make Mike watch an episode and he'll be on. Uh, I'm sure I'll watch an episode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not against watching it. It's just I don't watch reality. I don't. TV. I mean, I don't blame you. Again, we got enough drama in the real world. We don't, you know, need to watch it. But you know, if the artistry yeah. for I'd rather real drama than fake drama. <laughs> So not TNT, <laughs> that nose drama. Um, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Well, 
Perfect. Well, I'll, I guess I'll close the show out here right. then. Thanks for tuning in to Brew Crime. You can find us on all social media platforms at Brew Crime. We have a Facebook group at Brew Crime Group. If you'd like to support the show, head to patreon.com slash brew crime now. The money goes towards upgrading equipment and making the show that much better. You get one bonus episode a month, as well as early ad-free access to our episodes. So shout out to our Patreon supporters, True Crime Nana, 3 Biz In Podcast, Amber, and the Faves Over Lies Podcast. Cheers! All cases found on Brew Crime are written by Mike or the guest that appears on that episode, and the sources are put into the show notes for each episode. We always want to give credit to the people that research the cases we talk about. Check out the store at tpublic.com slash stores slash brew hyphen crime hyphen podcast, where you can purchase gear like t-shirts, phone cases, stickers, pillows, and all kinds of other cool stuff. Brew Crime's intro was created by Mike using Creative Commons Attribution License audio from purple-planet.com, soundbible.com, and freesoundeffects.com. Logo design by Ben Greenberg. Thanks for listening to this podcast, and it's been a production of Pacific Beer Chat. We have an active shooter. We have an active shooter inside the warehouse. Welcome to Active Shooter, a podcast that covers the whys, the hows, and the aftermath of active shooter events. We will delve into the lives interrupted by domestic terrorists. We will investigate the background of the shooter and together discuss ways in which they can be stopped or even prevented in the future. We will also discuss the failures of our mental health system. Shooter in the building, a second call says they uh, are being attacked. I've been shot. 1692 means we got shots fired. 415 AS up. Route 291, sounded like an automatic firearm. But appears to be shots fired. We will look at the media responses and discover together how they may have inadvertently inspired and contributed to the rise of the mass shootings. Active shooter, reports of an active shooter, active shooter, active shooter of mass casualty incidents. This is not a political podcast, nor a podcast about gun control. This is a podcast that studies the psychology behind active shooters and how and why they make the decisions they have made to take the lives of innocent people. I love you. I love you. It's going to be fine. Can you hide somewhere? Can you play dead? Welcome to Active Shooter. Thank you for listening. When you're caring for someone with Alzheimer's, it's normal to feel alone. Searching for answers to daily struggles and challenges and not finding solutions is also normal. There are books and Facebook pages galore, but when you're caring for someone with such a debilitating disease, time is a precious resource. I know. My mom had Alzheimer's for about 20 years, and I was her primary caregiver for the last three of them. I searched for solutions and a little bit of hope, but answers didn't come easily. One day, I realized a podcast might be the solution to that struggle. Only, there weren't very many options. So I created the Fading Memories podcast. My name is Jennifer, and I talk to people who have the answers to the questions that regularly frustrate caregivers. Join us weekly, wherever you get your podcasts, for information, inspiration, and honestly, some very needed laughs. But, um, Dan, let me start that again. Sure. Reading ahead too fast. <laughs> I'm not good at it. He was also quoted as saying, there was so much... Oh, oops, I just doubled that one up. Skip that mm-hmm. sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, n- no. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, she gave... <laughs> That's not nice. Nobody sees the fact that you're holding an ice pickup. <laughs> ice axe. Ice, ice, ice axe. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not masculine enough to know the difference between an ice pick and an ice axe. Oh, hey. <laughs> you know, mountaineering is not masculine. <laughs> it, <laughs> not that I'm a mountaineer, but that's what it's I really mean, for. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, I don't want to assume one way or another. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> she gave... Badass, but not, it is, not masculine. It is badass. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. Later, Clara asked House, her, her boyfriend, when he planted our quote. Sorry. <laughs> Let me try that again. Blech. Yeah. But mm. you know what? He, She'll be yeah. mine. And the next day. Oh, sorry. Clara wasn't there. <laughs> I should have read the next sentence. See oh. what I did there? Never mind. I do that all the time. Um, she's in Fluvanna Correctional Cell. Uh, let me try that again. 